Chapter six of the House of Cobwebs and Other Stories by George Gissing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Poor Gentleman. It was in the drawing room after dinner. Mrs. Charman, a large and kindly hostess, sank into a chair beside her little friend Mrs. Loring and sighed a question. How do you like Mr. Timperley? Very nice, just a little peculiar. "'Oh, he is peculiar, quite original. "'I wanted to tell you about him before we went down, but there wasn't time. "'Such a very old friend of ours. "'My dear husband and he were at school together, Harrovians. "'The sweetest, the most affectionate character. "'Too good for this world, I'm afraid. "'He takes everything so seriously. "'I shall never forget his grief at my poor husband's death. "'I'm telling Mrs. Loring about Mr. Timperley, Ada.' She addressed her married daughter, a quiet young woman who reproduced Mrs. Charman's good-natured countenance with something more of intelligence, the reflective serenity of a higher type. "'I'm sorry to see him looking so far from well,' remarked Mrs. Ware, in reply. "'He never had any colour, you know, and his life—but I must tell you,' she resumed to Mrs. Loring. "'He's a bachelor, in comfortable circumstances, and—' "'Would you believe it? He lives quite alone in one of the distressing parts of London. "'Where is it, Ada?' "'A poor street in Islington. "'Yes, there he lives, I'm afraid, in shocking lodgings. "'Must be so unhealthy, just to become acquainted with the life of poor people and be helpful to them. "'Isn't it heroic? He seems to have given up his whole life to it. "'One never meets him anywhere.' "'I think ours is the only house where he's seen. "'A noble life. "'He never talks about it. "'I'm sure you would never have suspected such a thing "'from his conversation at dinner.' "'Not for a moment,' answered Mrs. Loring, astonished. "'He wasn't very gossipy. "'I gathered that his chief interests were fretwork and foreign politics.' "'Mrs. Ware laughed. "'The very man!' When I was a little girl, he used to make all sorts of pretty things for me with his fret-saw, and when I grew old enough, he instructed me in the balance of power. It's possible, Mamma, that he writes leading articles. We should never hear of it. My dear, anything is possible with Mr. Timberley, and such a change this, after his country life. He had a beautiful little house near ours in Berkshire. I really can't help thinking that my husband's death caused him to leave it. He was so attached to Mr. Charman. When my husband died and we left Berkshire, we altogether lost sight of him, oh, for a couple of years. Then I met him by chance in London. Ada thinks there must have been some sentimental trouble. "'Dear Mamma," interposed the daughter, "'it was you, not I, who suggested that.' "'Was it? Well, perhaps it was. One can't help seeing that he has gone through something.' "'Of course it may be only pity for the poor souls he gives his life to. "'A wonderful man!' "'When masculine voices sounded at the drawing-room door, "'Mrs. Loring looked curiously for the eccentric gentleman. "'He entered last of all, a man of more than middle height, "'but much bowed in the shoulders, "'thin, ungraceful, with an irresolute step and a shy demeanour, his pale grey eyes, very soft in expression, looked timidly this way and that, from beneath brows nervously bent, and a self-obliterating smile wavered upon his lips. His hair had begun to thin and to turn grey, but he had a heavy moustache, which would better have sorted with sterner lineaments. As he walked, or sidled, into the room, his hands kept shutting and opening, with rather ludicrous effect something which was not exactly shabbiness but a lack of lustre of finish singled him among the group of men looking closer one saw that his black suit belonged to a fashion some years old his linen was irreproachable but he wore no sort of jewellery one little black stud showing on his front and at the cuffs solitaires of the same simple description he drifted into a corner and there would have sat alone seemingly at peace had not Mrs. Ware presently moved to a seat beside him. "'I hope you won't be staying in town through August, Mr. Timberley.' "'No. Oh, no. Oh, no, I think not.' "'But you seem uncertain. 
do forgive me if I say that I'm sure you need a change. Really, you know, you are not looking quite the thing. Now, can't I persuade you to join us at Lucerne? My husband would be so pleased, delighted to talk with you about the state of Europe. Give us a fortnight, do. My dear Mrs. Ware, you are kindness itself. I am deeply grateful. I can't easily express my sense of your most friendly thoughtfulness. But the truth is, I am half engaged to other friends. Indeed, I think I may almost say that I have practically... Yes, indeed, it amounts to that. He spoke in a thinly fluting voice, with a preciseness of enunciation akin to the more feebly clerical, and with smiles which became almost lachrymose in their expressiveness as he dropped from phrase to phrase of embarrassed circumlocution, and his long bony hands writhed together till the knuckles were white. "'Well, so long as you are going away, I'm so afraid lest your conscientiousness should go too far.' "'You won't benefit anybody, you know, by making yourself ill.' "'Obviously not. Ha <laughs> ha. I assure you that fact is patent to me. Health is a primary consideration. Nothing more detrimental to one's usefulness. Oh, to be sure, to be sure. There's the strain upon your sympathies. That must affect one's health, quite apart from an unhealthy atmosphere. "'But Islington is not unhealthy, my dear Mrs. Ware.' "'Believe me, the air has often quite a tonic quality. "'We are so high, you must remember. "'If only we could subdue in some degree "'the noxious exhalations of domestic and industrial chimneys. "'Oh, I assure you, Islington has every natural feature of salubrity.' "'Before the close of the evening there was a little music "'which Mr. Timperley seemed much to enjoy. "'He let his head fall back and stared upwards.' remaining wrapped in that posture for some moments after the music ceased, and at length recovering himself with a sigh. When he left the house, he donned an overcoat considerably too thick for the season, and bestowed in the pockets his patent leather shoes. His hat was a hard felt, high in the crown. He grasped an ill-folded umbrella, and set forth at a brisk walk, as if for the neighbouring station. But the railway was not his goal, nor yet the omnibus. Through the ambrosial night he walked and walked, at the steady pace of one accustomed to pedestrian exercise. From Notting Hill Gate to the Marble Arch, from the Marble Arch to New Oxford Street, thence by Theobald's Road to Pentonville, and up and up, until he attained the heights of his own salubrious quarter. Long after midnight he entered a narrow byway, which the pale moon showed to be decent, though not inviting. He admitted himself with a latchkey to a little house which smelt of glue, lit a candle-end which he found in his pocket, and ascended two flights of stairs to a back bedroom, its size eight feet by seven and a half. A few minutes more, and he lay sound asleep. Waking at eight o'clock, he knew the time by a bell that clanged in the neighbourhood, Mr. Timberley clad himself with nervous haste. On opening his door, he found lying outside a tray with the materials of a breakfast reduced to its lowest terms, half a pint of milk, bread, butter. At nine o'clock he went downstairs, tapped civilly at the door of the front parlour, and by an untuned voice was bidden enter. The room was occupied by an oldish man and a girl, addressing themselves to the day's work of plain bookbinding. "'Good morning to you, sir,' said Mr. Timperley, bending his head. "'Good morning, Miss Suggs. Bright, sunny, how it cheers one!' He stood rubbing his hands, as one might on a morning of sharp frost. The bookbinder, with a dry nod for greeting, forthwith set Mr. Timperley a task, to which that gentleman zealously applied himself. He was learning the elementary processes of the art. He worked with patience and some show of natural aptitude all through the working hours of the day. To this pass had things come with Mr. Timperley, a gentleman of Berkshire, once living in comfort and modest dignity on the fruit of sound investments, schooled at Harrow, a graduate of Cambridge, 
he had meditated the choice of a profession until it seemed on the whole too late to profess anything at all and as there was no need of such exertion he settled himself to a life of innocent idleness hard by the country house of his wealthy and influential friend mr charman softly the years flowed by his thoughts turned once or twice to marriage but a profound diffidence within held him from the initial step in the end he knew himself born for bachelorhood and with that estate was content well for him had he seen as clearly the delusiveness of other temptations in an evil moment he listened to mr charman whose familiar talk was of speculation of companies of shining percentages not on his own account was mr temperley lured he had enough and to spare but he thought of his sister married to an unsuccessful provincial barrister and of her six children whom it would be pleasant to help like the opulent uncle of fiction at their entering upon the world in mr charman he put blind faith with the result that one morning he found himself shivering on the edge of ruin the touch of confirmatory news and over he went no one was aware of it but mr charman himself and he a few days later lay sick unto death mr charman's own estate suffered inappreciably from what to his friend meant sheer disaster and mr timperley breathed not a word to the widow spoke not a word to any one at all except the lawyer who quietly wound up his affairs and the sister whose children must needs go without avuncular aid during the absence of his friendly neighbours after mr charman's death he quietly disappeared the poor gentleman was then close upon forty years old there remained to him a capital which he durst not expend invested it bore him an income upon which a labourer could scarce have subsisted because the only sure place of hiding was london and to london mr timperley betook himself not at once did he learn the art of combating starvation with minimum resources during his initiatory trials he was once brought so low by hunger and humiliation that he swallowed something of his pride and wrote to a certain acquaintance asking counsel and indirect help but only a man in mr timperley's position learns how vain is well-meaning advice and how impotent is social influence had he begged for money he would have received no doubt a cheque with words of compassion but mr timperley could never bring himself to that he tried to make profit of his former amusement fretwork and to a certain extent succeeded earning in six months half a sovereign but the prospect of adding one pound a year to his starveling dividends did not greatly exhilarate him all this time he was of course living in absolute solitude poverty is the great secluder unless one belongs to the rank which is born to it a sensitive man who no longer finds himself on equal terms with his natural associates shrinks into loneliness and learns with some surprise how very willing people are to forget his existence london is a wilderness abounding in anchorites voluntary or constrained as he wandered about the streets and parks or killed time in museums and galleries where nothing had to be paid mr timperley often recognized brethren in seclusion he understood the furtive glance which met his own he read the peaked visage marked with understanding sympathy the shabby genteel apparel no interchange of confidences between these lurking mortals they would like to speak but pride holds them aloof each goes on his silent and unfriended way until by good luck he finds himself in hospital or workhouse when at length the tongue is loosed and the sore heart pours forth its reproach of the world strange knowledge comes to a man in this position he learns wondrous economies and will feel a sort of pride in his ultimate discovery of how little money is needed to support life in his old days mr temperley would have laid it down as an axiom that one cannot live on less than such and such an income he found that a man can live on a few coppers a day he became aware of the price of things to eat and was taught the relative virtues of nutriment 
perforce a vegetarian, he found that a vegetable diet was good for his health, and delivered to himself many a scornful speech on the habits of the carnivorous multitude. He of necessity abjured alcohols, and straightway longed to utter his testimony on a teetotal platform. These were his satisfactions. They compensate astonishingly for the loss of many kinds of self-esteem. But it happened that one day, as he was in the act of drawing his poor little quarterly salvage at the Bank of England, a lady saw him and knew him. It was Mr. Charman's widow. "'Why, Mr. Timberley, what has become of you all this time? Why have I never heard from you? Is it true, as someone told me, that you have been living abroad?' So utterly was he disconcerted that, in a mechanical way, he echoed the lady's last word, abroad. "'But why didn't you write to us?' pursued Mrs. Charman, leaving him no time to say more. "'How very unkind! Why did you go away without a word? My daughter says that we must have unconsciously offended you in some way. Do explain. Surely there can't have been anything.' "'My dear Mrs. Charman, it is I alone who am to blame. I... the explanation is difficult.' It involves a multiplicity of detail. I beg you to interpret my unjustifiable behavior as... as pure idiosyncrasy. Oh, you must come and see me. You know that Ada's married? Yes, nearly a year ago. How glad she will be to see you again. So often she has spoken of you. When can you dine? Tomorrow? With pleasure. With great pleasure. Delightful. She gave her address, and they parted. Now, a proof that Mr. Timperley had never lost all hope of restitution to his native world lay in the fact of his having carefully preserved an evening suit with the appropriate patent leather shoes. Many a time he had been sorely tempted to sell these seeming superfluities. More than once, towards the end of his pinched quarter, the suit had been pledged for a few shillings but to part with the supreme symbol of respectability would have meant despair, a state of mind alien to Mr. Timperley's passive fortitude. His jewellery, even watch and chain, had long since gone. Such gods are not indispensable to a gentleman's outfit. He now congratulated himself on his prudence, for the meeting with Mrs. Charman had delighted as much as it embarrassed him and the prospect of an evening in society made his heart glow. He hastened home. He examined his garb of ceremony with anxious care, and found no glaring defect in it. A shirt, a collar, a necktie must needs be purchased. Happily he had the means. But how explain himself? Could he confess his place of abode, his startling poverty? To do so would be to make an appeal to the compassion of his old friends, and from that he shrank in horror. A gentleman will not, if it can possibly be avoided, reveal circumstances likely to cause pain. Must he, then, tell or imply a falsehood? The whole truth involved a reproach of Mrs. Charman's husband, a thought he could not bear. The next evening found him still worrying over this dilemma. He reached Mrs. Charman's house without having come to any decision. In the drawing-room three persons awaited him, the hostess with her daughter and son-in-law, Mr. and Mrs. Ware. The cordiality of his reception moved him all but to tears. Overcome by many emotions, he lost his head. He talked at random, and the result was so strange a piece of fiction that no sooner had he evolved it than he stood aghast at himself. It came in reply to the natural question where he was residing. At present, he smiled fatuously, I inhabit a bed-sitting room in a little street up at Islington. Dead silence followed. Eyes of wonder were fixed upon him. But for those eyes, who knows what confession Mr. Timperley might have made. As it was... I said, Mrs. Charman, that I had to confess an eccentricity. I hope it won't shock you. To be brief, I have devoted my poor energies to social work. I live among the poor, and as one of them, to obtain knowledge that cannot be otherwise procured. Oh, how noble! 
exclaimed the hostess. The poor gentleman's conscience smote him terribly. He could say no more. To spare his delicacy, his friends turned the conversation. Then, or afterwards, it never occurred to them to doubt the truth of what he had said. Mrs. Charman had seen him transacting business at the Bank of England, a place not suggestive of poverty, and he had always passed for a man somewhat original in his views and ways. Thus was Mr. Timperley committed to a singular piece of deception, a fraud which could not easily be discovered and which injured only its perpetrator. Since then, about a year had elapsed. Mr. Timperley had seen his friends perhaps half a dozen times, his enjoyment of their society pathetically intense, but troubled by any slightest allusion to his mode of life. It had come to be understood that he made it a matter of principle to hide his light under a bushel. So he seldom had to take a new step in positive falsehood. Of course he regretted ceaselessly the original deceit, for Mrs. Charman, a wealthy woman, might very well have assisted him to some not undignified mode of earning his living. As it was, he had hit upon the idea of making himself a bookbinder, a craft somewhat to his taste. For some months he had lodged in the bookbinder's house. One day courage came to him, and he entered into a compact with his landlord, whereby he was to pay for instructions by a certain period of unremunerated work after he became proficient. That stage was now approaching. On the whole, he felt much happier than in the time of brooding idleness. He looked forward to the day when he would have a little more money in his pocket, and no longer dread the last fortnight of each quarter, with its supperless nights. Mrs. Ware's invitation to Lucerne cost him pangs. Lucerne! Surely it was in some former state of existence that he had taken delightful holidays, as a matter of course. He thought of the many lovely places he knew, and so many dream landscapes. The London streets made them infinitely remote, utterly unreal. His three years of gloom and hardship were longer than all the life of placid contentment that came before. Lucerne! A man of more vigorous temper would have been maddened at the thought. But Mr. Temperley nursed it all day long, his emotions only expressing themselves in a little sigh or a sadly wistful smile. Having dined so well yesterday, he felt it his duty to expend less than usual on today's meals. About eight o'clock in the evening, after a meditative stroll in the air which he had so praised, he entered the shop where he was wont to make his modest purchases. A fat woman behind the counter nodded familiarly to him, with a grin at another customer. Mr. Timperley bowed, as was his courteous habit, "'Oblige me,' he said, "'with one new-laid egg and a small crisp lettuce. "'Only one tonight, eh?' said the woman. "'Thank you. Only one,' he replied, as if speaking in a drawing-room. "'Forgive me if I express a hope that it will be, "'in the strict sense of the word, new-laid. "'The last, I fancy, had got into that box by some oversight. "'Pardonable in the press of business.' "'They're always the same,' said the fat shopkeeper. "'We don't make no mistakes of that kind. "'Ah, forgive me. Perhaps I imagined.' Egg and lettuce were carefully deposited in a little handbag he carried, and he returned home. An hour later, when his meal was finished, and he sat on a straight-backed chair meditating in the twilight, a rap sounded at his door, and a letter was handed to him. So rarely did a letter arrive for Mr. Timperley that his hand shook as he examined the envelope. On opening it, the first thing he saw was a check. This excited him still more. He unfolded the written sheet with agitation. It came from Mrs. Ware, who wrote thus. My dear Mr. Timperley, after our talk last evening, I could not help thinking of you and your beautiful life of self-sacrifice. I contrasted the lot of these poor people with my own, which one cannot but feel is so undeservedly blessed and so rich in enjoyments. As a result of these thoughts, I feel impelled to send you a little contribution to your good work, a sort of thank-offering at the moment of setting off for a happy holiday. 
divide the money, please, among two or three of your most deserving pensioners. Or, if you see fit, give it all to one. I cling to the hope that we may see you at Lucerne. With very kind regards. The cheque was for five pounds. Mr. Timperley held it up by the window and gazed at it. By his present standards of value, five pounds seemed a very large sum. Think of what one could do with it. His boots, which had been twice repaired, would not decently serve him much longer. His trousers were in the last stage of presentability. The hat he wore, how carefully tended, was the same in which he had come to London three years ago. He stood in need, verily, of a new equipment from head to foot. And in Islington five pounds would more than cover the whole expense. When, pray, was he likely to have such a sum at his free disposal? He sighed deeply and stared about him in the dusk. The cheque was crossed. For the first time in his life, Mr. Timperley perceived that the crossing of a cheque may occasion its recipient a great deal of trouble. How was he to get it changed? He knew his landlord for a suspicious curmudgeon, and refusal of the favour, with such a look as Mr. Suggs knew how to give, would be a sore humiliation. Besides, it was very doubtful whether Mr. Suggs could make any use of the cheque himself. To whom else could he apply? Literally, to no one in London. Well, the first thing to do was to answer Mrs. Ware's letter. He lit his lamp and sat down at the crazy little deal table but his pen dipped several times into the ink before he found himself able to write. Dear Mrs. Ware. Then so long a pause that he seemed to be falling asleep. With a jerk, he bent again to his task. With sincere gratitude, I acknowledge the receipt of your most kind and generous donation. The money, again his hand lay idle for several minutes, shall be used as you wish, and I will render to you a detailed account of the benefits conferred by it. Never had he found a composition so difficult. He felt that he was expressing himself wretchedly. A clog was on his brain. It cost him an exertion of physical strength to conclude the letter. When it was done, he went out, purchased a stamp at a tobacconist's shop, and dropped the envelope into the post. Little slumber had Mr. Timperley that night. On lying down, he began to wonder where he should find the poor people worthy of sharing in this benefaction. Of course, he had no acquaintance with the class of persons of whom Mrs. Weir was thinking. In a sense, all the families round about were poor. But, he asked himself, had poverty the same meaning for them as for him? Was there a man or woman in this grimy street who, compared with himself, had any right to be called poor at all? An educated man, forced to live among the lower classes, arrives at many interesting conclusions with regard to them. One conclusion long since fixed in Mr. Timperley's mind was that the suffering of those classes is very much exaggerated by outsiders using a criterion quite inapplicable. He saw around him a world of coarse jollity, of contented labour, and of brutal apathy. It seemed to him more than probable that the only person in the street conscious of poverty and suffering under it was himself. From nightmarish dozing, he started with a vivid thought, a recollection which seemed to pierce his brain. To whom did he owe his fall from comfort and self-respect, and all his long miseries? To Mrs. Ware's father. And from this point of view, might the cheque for five pounds be considered as mere restitution? Might it not strictly be applicable to his own necessities? Another little gap of semi-consciousness led to another strange reflection. What if Mrs. Ware, a sensible woman, suspected, or even had discovered, the truth about him? What if she secretly meant the money for his own use? Earliest daylight made this suggestion look very insubstantial. On the other hand, it strengthened his memory of Mr. Charman's virtual indebtedness to him. He jumped out of bed to reach the cheque, and for an hour lay with it in his hand. Then he rose and dressed mechanically. After the day's work, he rambled in a street of large shops, 
a bootmaker's arrested him. He stood before the window for a long time, turning over and over in his pocket a sovereign, no small fraction of the ready coin which had to support him until dividend day. Then he crossed the threshold. Never did man use less discretion in the purchase of a pair of boots. His business was transacted in a dream. He spoke without hearing what he said. He stared at objects without perceiving them. The result was that not till he had got home with his easy old footgear under his arm did he become aware that the new boots pinched him most horribly. They creaked, too. Heavens, how they creaked! But doubtless all new boots had these faults. He had forgotten. It was so long since he had bought a pair. The fact was he felt dreadfully tired, utterly worn out. After munching a mouthful of supper he crept into bed. All night long he warred with his new boots. Footsore, he limped about the streets of a spectral city, where at every corner someone seemed to lie in ambush for him, and each time the lurking enemy proved to be no other than Mrs. Ware, who gazed at him with scornful eyes and let him totter by. The creaking of the boots was an articulate voice, which ever and anon screamed at him a terrible name. He shrank and shivered and groaned, but on he went, for in his hand he held a cross check, which he was bidden to get changed, and no one would change it. What a night! When he woke, his brain was heavy as lead, but his meditations were very lucid. Pray, what did he mean by that insane outlay of money, which he could not possibly afford, on a new and detestable pair of boots? The old would have lasted at all events till winter began, what was in his mind when he entered the shop? Did he intend? Merciful powers! Mr. Timperley was not much of a psychologist, but all at once he saw with artful perspicacity the moral crisis through which he had been living, and it taught him one more truth on the subject of poverty. Immediately after his breakfast he went downstairs and tapped at the door of Mr. Suggs' sitting-room. "'What is it?' asked the bookbinder, who was eating his fourth large rasher, and spoke with his mouth full. "'Sir, I beg leave of absence for an hour or two this morning. Business of some moment demands my attention.' Mr. Suggs answered, with the grace natural to his order, "'I suppose you can do as you like. I don't pay you nothing.' The other bowed and withdrew. Two days later he again penned a letter to Mrs. Ware. It ran thus. The money which you so kindly sent, and which I have already acknowledged, has now been distributed. To ensure a proper use of it, I handed the cheque, with clear instructions, to a clergyman in this neighbourhood, who has been so good as to jot down, on the sheet enclosed, a memorandum of his beneficiaries, which I trust will be satisfactory and gratifying to you. But why, you will ask, did I have recourse to a clergyman? Why did I not use my own experience, and give myself the pleasure of helping poor souls in whom I have a personal interest, I who have devoted my life to this mission of mercy? The answer is brief and plain. I have lied to you. I am not living in this place of my free will. I am not devoting myself to works of charity. I am, no, no, I was, merely a poor gentleman, who on a certain day found that he had wasted his substance in a foolish speculation, and who, ashamed to take his friends into his confidence, fled to a life of miserable obscurity. You see that I have added disgrace to the misfortune. I will not tell you how very near I came to something still worse. I have been serving an apprenticeship to a certain handicraft which will, I doubt not, enable me so to supplement my own scanty resources that I shall be in better circumstances than hitherto. I entreat you to forgive me, if you can, and henceforth to forget. Yours unworthily, S. V. Timberley. End of chapter 6
by George Gissing. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Miss Rodney's Leisure A young woman of about eight and twenty, in tailor-made costume, with unadorned hat of brown felt and irreproachable umbrella, a young woman who walked faster than any one in Wattleboro, yet never looked hurried, who crossed a muddy street seemingly without a thought for her skirts, yet somehow was never splashed, who held up her head like one thoroughly at home in the world, and frequently smiled at her own thoughts. Those who did not know her asked who she was. Those who had already made her acquaintance talked a good deal of the new mistress at the high school. By name, Miss Rodney. In less than a week after her arrival in the town, her opinions were cited and discussed by Wattleboro ladies. She brought with her the air of a university. She knew a great number of important people. She had a quiet decision of speech and manner which was found very impressive in Wattleboro drawing-rooms. The headmistress spoke of her in high terms, and the incumbent of St. Luke's, who knew her family, reported that she had always been remarkably clever. A stranger in town, Miss Rodney was recommended to the lodgings of Mrs. Ducker, a churchwarden's widow, but there she remained only for a week or two, and it was understood that she left because the rooms lacked character. Some persons understood this as an imputation on Mrs. Ducker, and were astonished. Others, who caught a glimpse of Miss Rodney's meaning, thought she must be fanciful. Her final choice of an abode gave general surprise, for though the street was one of those which Wattleboro opinion classed as respectable, the house itself, as Miss Rodney might have learnt from the incumbent of St. Luke's, in whose parish it was situated, had objectionable features. Nothing grave could be alleged against Mrs. Turpin, who regularly attended the Sunday evening service. But her husband, a carpenter, spent far too much time at the Swan with Two Necks. And then there was a lodger, young Mr. Rawcliffe, concerning whom Wattleboro had for some time been too well informed. Of such comments upon her proceeding Miss Rodney made light. In the aspect of the rooms she found a certain quaintness, which decidedly pleased her. And as for Mrs. Grundy, she added, je m'en fiche, which certain ladies of culture declared to be a polite expression of contempt. Miss Rodney never wasted time, and in matters of business had cultivated a notable brevity. Her interview with Mrs. Turpin, when she engaged the rooms, occupied perhaps a quarter of an hour. In that space of time she had sufficiently surveyed the house, had learnt all that seemed necessary as to its occupants, and had stated in the clearest possible way her present requirements. "'As a matter of course,' was her closing remark, "'the rooms will be thoroughly cleaned before I come in. At present they are filthy.' The landlady was too much astonished to reply. Miss Rodney's tones and bearing had so impressed her that she was at a loss for her usual loquacity, and could only stammer respectfully broken answers to whatever was asked. Assuredly no one had ever dared to tell her that her lodgings were filthy. Any ordinary person who had ventured upon such an insult would have been overwhelmed with clamorous retort. But Miss Rodney, with a pleasant smile and nod, went her way, and Mrs. Turpin stood at the open door gazing after her, bewildered twixt satisfaction and resentment. She was an easy-going, wool-witted creature, not ill-disposed, but sometimes mendacious and very indolent. Her life had always been what it was now, one of slatternly comfort and day-long gossip, for she came of a small tradesman's family, and had married an artisan who was always in well-paid work. Her children were two daughters, who, at seventeen and fifteen, remained in the house with her doing little or nothing, though they were supposed to wait upon the lodgers. For some months only two of the four rooms Mrs. Turpin was able to let had been occupied one by young Mr. Rawcliffe, always so called, though his age was nearly thirty, but, as was well known, he belonged to the real gentry, and Mrs. Turpin held him in reverence on that account, no matter for his little weaknesses, of which evil tongues, said Mrs. Turpin, of course made the most. 
He might be irregular in payment, he might come home at all hours and make unnecessary noise in going upstairs, he might at times grumble when his chop was ill-cooked, and, to tell the truth, he might occasionally be a little too free with the young ladies, that is to say, with Mabel and Lily Turpin. But all these things were forgiven him because he was a real gentleman, and spent just as little time as he liked daily in a solicitor's office. Miss Rodney arrived early on Saturday afternoon. Smiling and silent, she saw her luggage taken up to the bedroom. She paid the cabman, she beckoned her landlady into the parlour, which was on the ground floor. "'You haven't had time yet, Mrs. Turpin, to clean the rooms?' The landlady stammered a half-indignant surprise. Why, she and her daughters had given the room a thorough turnout. It was done only yesterday, and hours had been devoted to it. "'I see,' interrupted Miss Rodney, with quiet decision, "'that our notions of cleanliness differ considerably.' I am going out now, and I shall not be back till six o'clock. You will please clean the bedroom before then. The sitting-room shall be done on Monday. And therewith Miss Rodney left the house. On her return she found the bedroom relatively clean, and, knowing that too much must not be expected at once, she made no comment. That night, as she sat reading at eleven o'clock, a strange sound arose in the back part of the house. It was a man's voice, hilariously mirthful and breaking into rude song. After listening for a few minutes, Miss Rodney rang her bell, and the landlady appeared. "'Whose voice is that, I hear?' "'Voice, miss?' "'Who is shouting and singing?' asked Miss Rodney, in a disinterested tone. "'I'm sorry if it disturbs you, miss. You'll hear no more.' "'Mrs. Turpin, I asked who it was.' "'My husband, miss, but... thank you. Good night, Mrs. Turpin.' There was quiet for an hour or more. At something after midnight, when Miss Rodney had just finished writing half a dozen letters, there sounded a latch-key in the front door, and someone entered. This person, whoever it was, seemed to stumble about the passage in the dark, and at length banged against the listener's door. Miss Rodney started up and flung the door open. By the light of her lamp she saw a mustachioed face, highly flushed and grinning. "'Beg pardon,' cried the man, in a voice which harmonized with his look and bearing. "'Infernally dark here. Haven't got a match. Your Miss... pardon, forgot the name. New lodger. Oblige me with a light. Thanks awfully.' Without a word, Miss Rodney took a matchbox from her chimney-piece, entered the passage, entered the second parlour, that occupied by Mr. Rockcliffe, and lit a candle which stood on the table. "'You'll be so kind,' she said, looking her fellow lodger in the eyes, "'as not to set the house on fire.' "'Oh, no fear,' he replied with a high laugh. "'Quite accustomed. Thanks awfully, Miss. Pardon forgot the name.' But Miss Rodney was back in her sitting-room and had closed the door. Her breakfast next morning was served by Mabel Turpin, the elder daughter, a stupidly good-natured girl, who would fain have entered into conversation. Miss Rodney replied to a question that she had slept well, and added that, when she rang her bell, she would like to see Mrs. Turpin. Twenty minutes later the landlady entered. "'You wanted me, miss?' she began, in what was meant for a voice of dignity and reserve. "'I don't really wait on lodgers myself.' "'We'll talk about that another time, Mrs. Turpin. "'I wanted to say, first of all, "'that you have spoiled a piece of good bacon and two good eggs. "'I must trouble you to cook better than this. "'I'm very sorry, miss, that nothing seems to suit you. "'Oh, we shall get right in time,' interrupted Miss Rodney cheerfully. "'You will find that I have patience. "'Then I wanted to ask you whether your husband and your lodger "'come home tipsy every night or only on Saturdays.' The woman opened her eyes as wide as saucers, trying hard to look indignant. "'Tipsy, miss?' "'Well, perhaps I should have said drunk. I beg your pardon. All I could say, miss, is that young Mr. Rockcliffe has never behaved himself in this house excepting as the gentleman he is. You don't perhaps know that he belongs to a very high-connected family, miss, or I'm sure you wouldn't—' "'I see,' interposed Miss Rodney. "'That accounts for it.' "'But your husband, is he highly connected? 
"'I'm sure, miss, nobody could ever say that my husband took too much, "'not to say really too much. "'You might have heard him a bit merry, miss, "'but where's the harm of the Saturday night? "'Thank you. "'Then it is only on Saturday nights that Mr. Turpin becomes merry? "'I'm glad to know that. "'I shall get used to these little things.' but Mrs. Turpin did not feel sure that she would get used to her lodger. Sunday was spoiled for her by this beginning. When her husband woke from his prolonged slumbers and shouted for breakfast, which on this day of rest he always took in bed, the good woman went to him with a downcast visage and spoke querulously of Miss Rodney's behaviour. "'I won't wait upon her, so there. The girls may do it, and if she isn't satisfied, let her give notice. I'm sure I shan't be sorry.' "'She's given me more trouble in a day than poor Mrs. Brown did all the months she was here. "'I won't be at her beck and call, so there.' "'Before night came, this declaration was repeated times innumerable, "'and as it happened that Miss Rodney made no demand for her landlady's attendance, "'the good woman enjoyed a sense of triumphant self-assertion. "'On Monday morning, Mabel took in the breakfast "'and reported that Miss Rodney had made no remark, but a quarter of an hour later the bell rang, and Mrs. Turpin was summoned. Very red in the face, she obeyed. Having civilly greeted her, Miss Rodney inquired at what hour Mr. Turpin took his breakfast, and was answered with an air of surprise that he always left the house on weekdays at half-past seven. "'In that case,' said Miss Rodney, "'I will ask permission to come into your kitchen at a quarter to eight tomorrow morning "'to show you how to fry bacon and boil eggs. "'You mustn't mind. You know that teaching is my profession.' "'Mrs. Turpin, nevertheless, seemed to mind very much. "'Her generally good-tempered face wore a dogged sullenness, "'and she began to mutter something about such a thing never having been heard of. "'But Miss Rodney paid her no heed, renewed the appointment for the next morning, and waved a cheerful dismissal. Talking with a friend that day, the high school mistress gave a humorous description of her lodgings, and when the friend remarked that they must be very uncomfortable, and that surely she would not stay there, Miss Rodney replied that she had the firmest intention of staying, and, what was more, of being comfortable. "'I'm going to take that household in hand,' she added. "'The woman is foolish, but can be managed, I think, with a little patience.' I'm going to tackle the drunken husband as soon as I see my way. And as for the highly connected gentleman whose candle I had the honour of lighting, I shall turn him out. You have your work set, exclaimed the friend, laughing. Oh, a little employment for my leisure. This kind of thing relieves the monotony of a teacher's life and prevents one from growing old. Very systematically, she pursued her purpose of getting Mrs. Trippin in hand. The two points at which she first aimed were the keeping clean of her room and the decent preparation of her meals. Never losing her temper, never seeming to notice the landlady's sullen mood, always using a tone of legitimate authority, touched sometimes with humorous compassion, she exacted obedience to her directions, but was well aware that at any moment the burden of a new civilization might prove too heavy for the Turpin family and cause revolt. A week went by. It was again Saturday, and Miss Rodney devoted a part of the morning, there being no school today, to culinary instruction. Mabel and Lily shared the lesson with their mother, but both young ladies wore an air of condescension and grimaced at Miss Rodney behind her back. Mrs. Turpin was obstinately mute. The pride of ignorance stiffened her backbone and curled her lip. Miss Rodney's leisure generally had its task, though as a matter of principle she took daily exercise, her walking or cycling was always an opportunity for thinking something out, and this afternoon, as she sped on wheels some ten miles from Wattleboro, her mind was busy with the problem of Mrs. Turpin's husband. From her clerical friend of St. Luke's she had learnt that Turpin was at bottom a decent sort of man, rather intelligent, and that it was only during the last year or two that he had taken to passing his evenings at the public-house. Causes for his decline could be suggested. The carpenter had lost his only son, a lad of whom he was very fond. The boy's death quite broke him down at the time, 
and perhaps he had begun to drink as a way of forgetting his trouble. Perhaps, too, his foolish, slatternly wife bore part of the blame, for his home had always been comfortless, and such companionship must in the long run tell on a man. Reflecting upon this, Miss Rodney had an idea, and she took no time in putting it into practice. When Mabel brought in her tea, she asked the girl whether her father was at home. "'I think he is, miss,' was the distant reply, for Mabel had been bidden by her mother to show a proper spirit when Miss Rodney addressed her. "'You think so? Will you please make sure? And if you are right, ask Mr. Turpin to be so kind as to let me have a word with him.' Startled and puzzled, the girl left the room. Miss Rodney waited, but no one came. When ten minutes had elapsed, she rang the bell. A few minutes more, and there sounded a heavy foot in the passage. Then a heavy knock at the door, and Mr. Turpin presented himself. He was a short, sturdy man, with hair and beard of the hue known as Ginger, and a face which told in his favour. Vicious he could assuredly not be with those honest grey eyes, but one easily imagined him weak in character, and his attitude as he stood just within the room, half respectful, half assertive, betrayed an embarrassment altogether encouraging to Miss Rodney. In her pleasantest tone she begged him to be seated. "'Thank you, miss,' he replied in a deep voice, which sounded huskily, but had nothing of surliness. "'I suppose you want to complain about something, and I'd rather get it over standing.' "'I was not going to make any complaint, Mr. Turpin.' "'I'm glad to hear it, miss, for my wife wished me to say she'd done about all she could, and if things weren't to your liking, she thought it would be best for all if you suited yourself in somebody else's lodgings.' It evidently cost the man no little effort to deliver his message. There was a nervous twitching about his person, and he could not look Miss Rodney straight in the face. She, observant of this, kept a very steady eye on him, and spoke with all possible calmness. "'I have not the least desire to change my lodgings, Mr. Turpin. Things are going on quite well. There is an improvement in the cooking, in the cleaning, in everything. And, with a little patience, I am sure we shall all come to understand one another. What I wanted to speak to you about was a little practical matter in which you may be able to help me.' I teach mathematics at the high school, and I have an idea that I might make certain points in geometry easier to my young girls if I could demonstrate them in a mechanical way. Pray look here. You see the shapes I have sketched on this piece of paper? Do you think you could make them for me in wood? The carpenter was moved to a show of reluctant interest. He took the paper, balanced himself now on one leg, now on the other, and said at length that he thought he saw what was wanted. Miss Rodney, coming to his side, explained in more detail. His interest grew more active. "'That's Euclid, miss?' "'To be sure. Do you remember your Euclid?' "'My own schooling never went as far as that,' he replied in a muttering voice. "'But my Harry used to do Euclid at the grammar school, and I got into a sort of way of doing it with him.' Miss Rodney kept a moment's silence. Then, quietly and kindly, she asked one or two questions about the boy who had died. The father answered in an awkward, confused way, as if speaking only by constraint. "'Well, I'll see what I can do, miss,' he added abruptly, folding the paper to take away. "'You'd like them soon?' "'Yes. I was going to ask you, Mr. Turpin, whether you could do them this evening.' "'Then I should have them for Monday morning.' "'Turpin hesitated, shuffled his feet, and seemed to reflect uneasily. "'But he said at length that he would see about it, "'and, with a rough bow, got out of the room. "'That night no hilarious sounds came from the kitchen. "'On Sunday morning, when Miss Rodney went into her sitting-room, "'she found on the table the wooden geometrical forms, "'excellently made, just as she wished.' Mabel, who came with breakfast, was bidden to thank her father, and to say that Miss Rodney would like to speak with him again, if his leisure allowed, after tea-time on Monday. At that hour the carpenter did not fail to present himself, distrustful still, but less embarrassed. Miss Rodney praised his work, and desired to pay for it, 
"'Oh, that wasn't worth talking about,' said Turpin. "'But the lady insisted, and money changed hands. "'This piece of business transacted, Miss Rodney produced a Euclid, "'and asked Turpin to show her how far he had gone in it with his boy Harry. "'The subject proved fruitful of conversation. "'It became evident that the carpenter had a mathematical bias, "'and could be readily interested in such things as geometrical problems.' "'Why should he not take up the subject again?' "'Nay, miss,' replied Turpin, speaking at length quite naturally, "'I shouldn't have the heart, if my Harry had lived.' But Miss Rodney stuck to the point, and succeeded in making him promise that he would get out the old Euclid and have a look at it in his leisure time. As he withdrew, the man had a pleasant smile on his honest face. On the next Saturday evening, the house was again quiet. Meanwhile, relations between Mrs. Turpin and her lodger were becoming less strained. For the first time in her life, the flabby, foolish woman had to do with a person of firm will and bright intelligence. Not being vicious of temper, she necessarily felt herself submitting to domination, and darkly surmised that the rule might in some way be good for her. All the sluggard and slattern in her, all the obstinacy of lifelong habits, hung back from the new things which Miss Rodney was forcing upon her acceptance, but she was no longer moved by active resentment. To be told that she cooked badly had long ceased to be an insult and was becoming merely a worrying truism. That she lived in dirt there seemed no way of denying, and though every muscle groaned, she began to look upon the physical exertion of dusting and scrubbing as part of her lot in life. Why she submitted, Mrs. Turpin could not have told you, and, as was presently to be seen, there were regions of her mind still unconquered, instincts of resistance which yet had to come into play. For during all this time Miss Rodney had had her eye on her fellow lodger, Mr. Rawcliffe and the more she observed this gentleman, the more resolute she became to turn him out of the house. But it was plain to her that the undertaking would be no easy one. In the landlady's eye, Mr. Rockcliffe, though not perhaps a faultless specimen of humanity, conferred an honour on her house by residing in it. The idea of giving him notice to quit was inconceivable to her. This came out very clearly in the first frank conversation which Miss Rodney held with her on the topic. It happened that Mr. Rawcliffe had passed an evening at home in the company of his friends. After supping together, the gentlemen indulged in merriment, which, towards midnight, became uproarious. In the morning, Mrs. Turpin mumbled a shamefaced apology for this disturbance of Miss Rodney's repose. "'Why don't you take this opportunity and get rid of him?' asked the lodger, in her matter-of-fact tone. "'Oh, miss!' "'Yes, it's your plain duty to do so. He gives your house a bad character. He sets a bad example to your husband. He has a bad influence on your daughters. Oh, miss, I don't think.' "'Just so, Mrs. Turpin, you don't think.' If you had, you would long ago have noticed that his behaviour to those girls is not at all such as it should be. More than once I have chanced to hear bits of talk when either Mabel or Lily was in his sitting-room, and didn't like the tone of it. In plain English, the man is a blackguard. Mrs. Turpin gasped. But, miss, you forget what family he belongs to. Don't be a simpleton, Mrs. Turpin. The blackguard is found in every rank of life. Now suppose you go to him as soon as he gets up and quietly give him notice. You've no idea how much better you would feel after it. But Mrs. Turpin trembled at the suggestion. It was evident that no ordinary argument or persuasion would bring her to such a step. Miss Rodney put the matter aside for the moment. She had found no difficulty in getting information about Mr. Rawcliffe. It was true that he belonged to a family of some esteem in the Wattleboro neighbourhood, but his father had died in embarrassed circumstances, and his mother was now the wife of a prosperous merchant in another town. To his stepfather, Rawcliffe owed an expensive education and two or three starts in life, 
he was in his second year of articles to a wattleborough solicitor but there seemed little probability of his ever earning a living by the law and reports of his excesses which reached the stepfather's ears had begun to make the young man's position decidedly precarious the incumbent of st luke's whom mr rockcliffe had more than once insulted took much interest in miss rodney's design against their common enemy he could not himself take active part in the campaign but he never met the high school mistress without inquiring what progress she had made the conquest of turpin who now for several weeks had kept sober and spent his evenings in mathematical study was a most encouraging circumstance but miss rodney had no thought of using her influence over the landlady's husband to assail rockcliffe's position she would rely upon herself alone in this as in all other things only by constant watchfulness and energy did she maintain her control over mrs turpin who was ready at any moment to relapse into her old slatternly ways it was not enough to hold the ground that had been gained there must be progressive conquest and to this end miss rodney one day broached a subject which had already been discussed between her and her clerical ally why do you keep both your girls at home mrs turpin she asked what should i do with them miss i don't hold with sending girls into shops or else they've an aunt in birmingham who's a manageress of that isn't my idea interposed miss rodney quietly i have been asked if i knew of a girl who could go into a country house not far from here as a second housemaid and it occurred to me that lily a sound of indignant protest escaped the landlady which miss rodney steadily regarding her purposely misinterpreted no no of course she is not really capable of taking such a position but the lady of whom i am speaking would not mind an untrained girl who came from a decent house isn't it worth thinking of mrs turpin was red with suppressed indignation but as usual she could not look her lodger defiantly in the face we are not so poor miss she exclaimed that we need send our daughters into service why of course not mrs turpin and that's one of the reasons why lily might suit this lady but here was another rock of resistance which promised to give miss rodney a good deal of trouble the landlady's pride was outraged and after the manner of the inarticulate she could think of no adequate reply save that which took the form of personal abuse restrained from this by more than one consideration she stood voiceless her bosom heaving well you shall think it over said miss rodney and we'll speak of it again in a day or two mrs turpin without another word took herself out of the room save for that singular meeting on miss rodney's first night in the house mr rawcliffe and the energetic lady had held no intercourse whatever their parlours being opposite to each other on the ground floor they necessarily came face to face now and then but the high school mistress behaved as though she saw no one and the solicitor's clerk after one or two attempts at polite formality adopted a like demeanour the man's proximity caused his neighbour a ceaseless irritation of all objectionable types of humanity this loafing and boozing degenerate was to miss rodney perhaps the least endurable his mere countenance excited her animosity for feebleness and conceit things abhorrent to her were legible in every line of the trivial features and a full moustache evidently subjected to training served only as emphasis of foppish imbecility i could beat him she exclaimed more than once within herself overcome with contemptuous wrath when she passed mr rawcliffe and indeed had it been possible to settle the matter thus simply no doubt mr rawcliffe's rooms would very soon have been vacant the crisis upon which miss rodney had resolved came about quite unexpectedly one sunday evening mrs turpin and her daughters had gone as usual to church the carpenter had gone to smoke a pipe with a neighbour and mr rawcliffe believed himself alone in the house but miss rodney was not at church this evening she had a headache and after tea lay down in her bedroom for a while soon impatient of repose she got up and went to her parlour 
the door, to her surprise, was partly open. Entering, the tread of her slippered feet was noiseless, she beheld an astonishing spectacle. Before her writing-table, his back to her, stood Mr. Rockliffe, engaged in the deliberate perusal of a letter which he had found there. For a moment she observed him. Then she spoke. "'What business have you here?' Rockliffe gave such a start that he almost jumped from the ground. His face, as he put down the letter and turned, was that of a gibbering idiot. His lips moved, but no sound came from them. "'What are you doing in my room?' demanded Miss Rodney in her severest tones. "'I really beg your pardon. I really beg—' "'I suppose this is not the first visit with which you have honoured me?' "'The first, indeed, I assure you, the very first. "'A foolish curiosity. I really feel quite ashamed of myself. "'I throw myself upon your indulgence.' "'The man had become voluble. "'He approached Miss Rodney, smiling in a sickly way, his head bobbing forward. "'It's something,' he replied, "'that you have still the grace to feel ashamed. "'Well, there's no need for us to discuss this matter. "'It can have, of course, only one result.' "'Tomorrow morning you will oblige me by giving notice to Mrs. Turpin, a week's notice.' "'Leave the house?' exclaimed Rockliffe. "'On Saturday next, or as much sooner as you like.' "'Oh, but really—' "'As you please,' said Miss Rodney, looking him sternly in the face. "'In that case I complain to the landlady of your behaviour, and insist on her getting rid of you. You ought to have been turned out long ago.' "'You are a nuisance and worse than a nuisance. "'Be so good as to leave the room.' "'Rockliffe, his shoulders humped, moved towards the door, "'but before reaching it he stopped and said doggedly, "'I can't give notice.' "'Why not?' "'I owe Mrs. Turpin money.' "'Naturally. "'But you will go all the same.' "'A vicious light flashed into the man's eyes. "'If it comes to that, I shall not go.' "'Indeed,' said Miss Rodney, calmly and coldly. "'We will see about it. "'In the meantime, leave the room, sir.' "'Rockliffe nodded, grinned, and withdrew. "'Late that evening there was a conversation "'between Miss Rodney and Mrs. Turpin. "'The landlady, though declaring herself horrified "'at what had happened, did her best to plead "'for Mr. Rockliffe's forgiveness "'and would not be brought to the point "'of promising to give him notice.' "'Very well, Mrs. Turpin,' said Miss Rodney at length. "'Either he leaves the house, or I do.' Resolved, as she was, not to quit her lodgings, this was a bold declaration. A meeker spirit would have trembled at the possibility that Mrs. Turpin might be only too glad to free herself from a subjection which, again and again, had all but driven her to extremities. But Miss Rodney had the soul of a conqueror, she saw only her will and the straight way to it to tell you the truth miss said the landlady sore perplexed he's rather backward with his rent very foolish of you to have allowed him to get into your debt the probability is that he would never pay his arrears they will only increase the longer he stays but i have no more time to spare at present please understand that by saturday next it must be settled which of your lodgers is to go Mrs. Turpin had never been so worried. The more she thought of the possibility of Miss Rodney's leaving the house, the less did she like it. Notwithstanding Mr. Rockliffe's family, it was growing clear to her that, as a stamp of respectability and a source of credit, the high school mistress was worth more than the solicitor's clerk. Then there was the astonishing change that had come over Turpin, owing, it seemed, to his talk with Miss Rodney. The man spent all his leisure time in making shapes and figuring, just as he used to do when poor Harry was at the grammar school. If Miss Rodney disappeared, it seemed only too probable that Turpin would be off again to the swan with two necks. On the other hand, the thought of giving notice to Mr. Rockliffe caused her something like dismay. How could she have the face to turn a real gentleman out of her house? Yes, but was it not true that she had lost money by him, and stood to lose more, 
She had never dared to tell her husband of Mr. Rockliffe's frequent shortcomings in the matter of weekly payments. When the easy-going young man smiled and nodded and said, "'It'll be all right, you know, Mrs. Turpin. You can trust me, I hope,' she could do nothing but acquiesce, and Mr. Rockliffe was more and more disposed to take advantage of this weakness. If she could find courage to go through with the thing, perhaps she would be glad when it was over.' Three days went by. Rawcliffe led an unusually quiet and regular life. There came the day on which his weekly bill was presented. Mrs. Turpin brought it in person at breakfast, and stood with it in her hand, an image of vacillation. Her lodger made one of his familiar jokes. She laughed feebly. No, the words would not come to her lips. She was physically incapable of giving him notice. "'By the by, Mrs. Turpin,' said Rockliffe, in an offhand way, as he glanced at the bill, "'how much exactly do I owe you?' Pleasantly agitated, his landlady mentioned the sum. "'Ah, I must settle that. I tell you what, Mrs. Turpin, let it stand over for another month, and we'll square things up at Christmas. Will that suit you?' And, by way of encouragement, he paid his week's account on the spot, without a penny of deduction." Mrs. Turpin left the room in greater embarrassment than ever. Saturday came. At breakfast, Miss Rodney sent for the landlady, who made a timid appearance just within the room. "'Good morning, Mrs. Turpin. What news have you for me? You know what I mean?' The landlady took a step forward and began babbling excuses, explanations, entreaties. She was coldly and decisively interrupted. "'Thank you, Mrs. Turpin, that will do. "'A week today I leave.' "'With a sound which was half a sob and half grunt, "'Mrs. Turpin bounced from the room. "'It was now inevitable that she should report "'the state of things to her husband, "'and that evening half an hour's circumlocution "'brought her to the point. "'Which of the two lodges should go?' "'The carpenter paused, pipe in mouth, before him a geometrical figure over which he had puzzled for a day or two, and about which, if he could find courage, he wished to consult the high school mistress. He reflected for five minutes, and uttered an unhesitating decision. Mr. Rockliffe must go. Naturally, his wife broke into indignant clamour, and the debate lasted for an hour or two. But Turpin could be firm when he liked, and he had solid reasons for preferring to keep Miss Rodney in the house. At four o'clock, Mrs. Turpin crept softly to the sitting-room, where her offended lodger was quietly reading. "'I wanted just to say, Miss, that I'm willing to give Mr. Rockliffe notice next Wednesday.' "'Thank you, Mrs. Turpin,' was the cold reply. "'I have already taken other rooms.' The landlady gasped and for a moment could say nothing. Then she besought Miss Rodney to change her mind. Mr. Rockliffe should leave, indeed he should, on Wednesday week. But Miss Rodney had only one reply. She had found other rooms that suited her, and she requested to be left in peace. At eleven Mr. Rockliffe came home. He was unnaturally sober for Saturday night, and found his way into the parlour without difficulty. There, in a minute or two, he was confronted by his landlady and her husband. They closed the door behind them, and stood in a resolute attitude. "'Mr. Rockliffe,' began Turpin, "'you must leave these lodgings, sir, on Wednesday next.' "'Hullo! What's all this about?' cried the other. "'What do you mean, Turpin?' The carpenter made plain his meaning spoke of Miss Rodney's complaint, of the irregular payment, for his wife, in her stress, had avowed everything, and of other subjects of dissatisfaction. The lodger must go. There was an end of it. Rockliffe, putting on all his dignity, demanded the legal week's notice. Turpin demanded the sum in arrear. There was an exchange of high words, and the interview ended with mutual defiance. A moment after Turpin and his wife knocked at Miss Rodney's door, for she was still in her parlour. There followed a brief conversation, with the result that Miss Rodney graciously consented to remain on the understanding that Mr. Rockliffe left the house not later than Wednesday. 
Enraged at the treatment he was receiving, Rockcliffe loudly declared that he would not budge. Turpin warned him that if he had made no preparations for departure on Wednesday, he would be forcibly ejected and the door closed against him. "'You haven't the right to do it,' shouted the lodger. "'I'll sue you for damages.' "'And I,' retorted the carpenter, "'will sue you for the money you owe me.' The end could not be doubtful. Rockcliffe, besides being a poor creature, knew very well that it was dangerous for him to get involved in a scandal. His stepfather, upon whom he depended, asked but a fair excuse for cutting him adrift, and more than one grave warning had come from his mother during the past few months. But he enjoyed a little blustering, and even at breakfast time on Wednesday his attitude was that of contemptuous defiance. In vain had Mrs. Turpin tried to coax him with maternal suavity. In vain had Mabel and Lily, when serving his meals, whispered abuse of Miss Rodney, and promised to find some way of getting rid of her so that Rockcliffe might return. In a voice loud enough to be heard by his enemy in the opposite parlour, he declared that no cat of a schoolteacher should get the better of him, as a matter of fact, however, he arranged on Tuesday evening to take a couple of cheaper rooms just outside the town, and ordered a cab to come for him at eleven next morning. "'You know what the understanding is, Mr. Rockcliffe,' said Turpin, putting his head into the room as the lodger sat at breakfast. "'I'm a man of my word.' "'Don't come bawling here,' cried the other, with a face of scorn. And at noon the house knew him no more. Miss Rodney, on that same day, was able to offer her landlady a new lodger. She had not spoken of this before, being resolved to triumph by mere force of will. "'The next thing,' she remarked to a friend when telling the story, "'is to pack off one of the girls into service. I shall manage it by Christmas.' And she added, with humorous complacency, it does one good to be making a sort of order in one's own little corner of the world. End of chapter 7